Good morning, church. Would you bow with me? Let's pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and, and we ask that your spirit move powerfully in our presence today, Lord. We pray that you illuminate the darkness, the darkness in the world, the darkness in our souls. We pray that you uh, reveal our sin to us so that so that we might recognize more clearly the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us. Father, help us be whole through your Son. Help us be righteous through Christ. That only you are possible of this through your, through your Holy Spirit. Father, be with us in this room today. And pray for Carmen as she uh, teaches our little ones today the ways of Jesus. And, and Father, that the that the young kids that are about to be dismissed, Father, that they might see you clearly today, that you are Lord. You're the Lord of lords, the King of kings. You are God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids. You can head with Miss Carmen. Walk. Okay. Walk. Walk. <laughs> Well, welcome to Christ Church. If you're new with us today, my name is Blade. I'm the pastor here. If you're watching online, I want to welcome you as well. We know that a lot of people are going to visit us online before they visit us in person. We also know that it is still the time of sickness. Uh, man, I battled with something this week. I don't know what it was, but it was not pretty, okay? Uh, so if you've been sick recently, man, just keep pushing forward. If you're watching online and you're sick, we're going to be praying for you uh, today as well. well. Welcome to part two of I Am Jesus in His Own Words. Why don't you turn to your neighbor just real quick and say, He is. He is. He's not the I was. He's not the I will be. He is the I am. Right? And we're in part two of this series, Jesus in His Own Words. So real quickly, the idea from this series comes from the book of Exodus where Moses is, is being called by the Lord through a burning bush. And Moses says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for you, but who should I tell people that you are? And the Lord, speaking through the burning bush, says, tell them I am has sent you. Wait, your name is what? I am who I am. And seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus completes this phrase. Last week, we talked about Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever takes of me and eats of my flesh and drinks of my blood, which we recognize of him doing upon the cross, right? Whoever takes of my flesh and drinks of my blood, which we celebrate in communion, they will have everlasting life. Right? Today, we're going to talk about his next statement, which is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 8. So I'm going to invite you to, to grab a Bible. Uh, there should be one under a seat near you. Uh, today, I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation and the New International Version. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. Today, our, our, our topic comes from Jesus' words in John, chapter 8, verse 12. This is what the Lord says. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, he says, will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 12. Let me read it again. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. By a show of hands, if you're not too ashamed, I'm not too ashamed because I got some stories for you, right? But if you're not ashamed as an adult to admit this, by a simple show of hands, how many of us were afraid of the dark as a kid? Oh my gosh. Afra now, let me, let, me, let me progress this just a little bit. As an adult, right? Not all of us, are, oh, you're already raising your hands. How many of you are still afraid of the dark? Wow. Well, are, do we have good news for you today? Um, so my wife and I, we don't, 
We don't watch a whole lot of movies. We don't watch a whole lot of TV shows. We're those people to where it's like on Netflix and we watch all the seasons of The Office and then we get to the end of it and we're trying to find a new show and we're like, what should we watch? And we're like, I don't know. You want to start The Office over, right? (laughs) We watch all of Parks and Rec. What do you want to do now? I don't know. You want to watch Parks and Rec again, right? But we... uh, we ventured out two nights ago. The kids had finally fallen asleep. It was like 10 o'clock, and we're laying in bed, and we have my laptop sitting in between us, and we're like, let's watch a show. I saw on Facebook, which I should never trust you Facebook people. <coughs> I'm never trusting you again. I saw somebody say that they had just binged watched some new show from Netflix called uh, Lock and Key. Have you guys heard of this show? I had not heard of it any, either, but my friend said, man, this show is awesome. And I'm like, well, I trust him, so we'll watch this show. So we're laying in bed, and if you guys know my wife, she is a scaredy cat, right? She'll admit this, right? We got to, like, sleep with the light on out in the living room or something, okay? Uh, but we're watching this show, and we're like, man, this is kind of freaky. Like, it's, kinda, it's actually kind of scary. Like, this dude's leaning, leaning over a t- like a cave or something, and some woman's voice is echoing back. And Anyway, we made it through the episode, but I had nightmares that night. Like, I don't do scary shows, okay? I just, it's not my thing. I did not know it was going to be, like, scary freaky, okay? I, I like to think that I am hyper aware of spiritual darkness in our world. I don't need help by somebody else's imagination to flesh that out, okay? But I am, like, I, I like lights on. Sometimes my dog wants to go out and take, uh, go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, I, I got to keep this PG, and I'm not good at that, right? <laughs> anyway, he likes to go out, like, super late at night to do his thing, and, uh, man, I got to put my flashlight on, right, and make sure I'm not tripping over everything, even the slightest noise. I'm like, man, was that a gunshot? I live in Parsons, so yes, (laughs) it was a gunshot. (laughs) You know, there's a big contrast between light and dark. Lightness, darkness. Here's Here's how the Bible explains this. He says that, the Bible says that God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. God is light. And on the flip side of that, Satan, the prince of deceit, the deceiver, right, the prince of darkness is darkness. And in him, there is no light. So the Bible has a lot to say about this. In in the New Testament, you're going to find this dude named Paul. Now, Paul used to be a guy named Saul. Now, Saul was a persecutor of the church. He, he was a Jew among Jews. He just he did not do well with Christians. Now, at the time, he thought he was doing what was right. Now, let, I'm going to read to you out of the book of Acts chapter 26, just real quick to set the stage for what Jesus is going to talk about today, okay? So Paul later becomes one of Jesus' disciples and a church planter uh, among a vast region. Here's what Paul says in the book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 9, he says this. So Paul is before Agrippa, and this is what he says. He says, I used to believe that I ought to do everything that I could to oppose the name of Jesus the Nazarene. Paul says, I used to think that I had to do anything I could to oppose his name. Indeed, he says, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priests, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison. And I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Acts 26, verse 11. Many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse the name of Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. One day, he says, 
I was on such a mission to Damascus. Armed with the authority and commission of the leading priest, about noon, your majesty, I was on the road, and this is what Paul says, a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone down on me and my companions, and we all fell down, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, this is what the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is useless for you to fight against my will. And Saul replies, he says, Who are you? Who are you, Lord? And this is how the Lord responds. I am Jesus, the one whom you keep persecuting. Now stand up to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Well, this is a giant thing happening. Saul at that time, was persecuting and killing Christians. He was putting them into prison. He was even going so far as to go to foreign cities and chase them down, which I would be terrible at because I don't like to run, right? Proverbs, remember Proverbs, only the wicked run when no one is chasing them, okay? Right? But Paul would, Saul would go and he would chase down Christians and torture them. And now Jesus says, it's useless. For you to run from me. For you to run from my will. For I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness. Tell people that you have seen me. And tell them that I will show you in the future. Now take a look at verse 17 with me. And I will rescue you from both your own people and the Gentiles. Yes, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And here's what the Lord says. Here's why he's sending him to the Gentiles, which is us. We're not Jewish people, unless you are, and I don't know about it. This is why Jesus sent Paul to the Gentiles. Verse 18, to open their eyes so that they might turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Over and over in the Bible, There is this common theme of dark contrasting light. You see it in creation when there was a darkness covering the face of the deep, the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light and it was good. Now if you have your Bibles open, turn back to John chapter 8. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But it's good to understand why he said this. Why would Jesus say, I am the light of the world? There's this story of a woman who was caught in adultery. Right before Jesus says, I am the light of the world, there's this story of a woman who had been caught in adultery and she's fixing to get stoned to death. Jesus comes, and this is what happens. If you have your Bibles open, John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, And said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. How many times are they going to say it, right? You get the point. They say, in the law, verse 5, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Women that were caught in the act of adultery should be stoned to death, they say. Now, what do you say? They look at Jesus, and they say, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis to accuse Jesus of not being the Messiah. So, here we have Jesus in the temple courts. You have a bunch of religious leaders standing outside in the temple courts. And they're gathered around this woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. 
They got stones in their hands, and they're fixing to kill her. When Jesus walks up, and they say, look at this woman. She's been caught in adultery. The law, the law of Moses, remember God through the burning bush said to Moses, I am. They take Moses very seriously. What do you say that we should do? Now, according to the law, she is absolutely guilty. She is guilty. It's one of the worst sins that she could have committed. And Jesus is in a predicament, so we would think. He's not in a predicament. But we would think he would be. But Jesus, being full of wisdom, has a couple choices. If Jesus agreed, he would lose his reputation of being a loving Messiah. If Jesus were to look at this woman that was caught in adultery and said, yes, stone her to death, Jesus would have lost his reputation of being loving. But the flip side of that is that if Jesus looks at this woman and forgives her, to the people, it would look like he was condoning adultery. It would look like he was breaking the law of Moses. So, the law reveals her guilt. The law does a lot of things. The law reveals if we've lied. The law reveals if we've stolen. Right? Without the law of Moses, we wouldn't know that these things were even bad. Where does the, where does the moral law come from? It comes from God. The law reveals if we've lied, if we've stolen, it reveals if we've lusted, it reveals if we've taken God's name in vain. And unless we see ourselves as sinners, we won't see our need for a Savior. So this woman is in a predicament, Jesus is in a predicament, and you got the religious leaders that are trying to trap him so that they could get rid of him. So what happens next? In verse 6, it says this, Jesus chooses not to do either one of these things. He doesn't choose to, to, uh, to agree and have her stoned. And he doesn't choose to immediately forgive and condone adultery. What does he choose to do? He chooses to bend down into the dirt. And this is what John 8, verse 6 says. Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. All right, this is kind of a weird thing. Jesus, like, this, this chick's about to get stoned to death, and, like, you're just going to sit down? But he bends down, and he starts writing in the dirt with his finger. What did he write? If you look at the Greek, which I'm not a Greek scholar, but I've done enough study of this passage that I could understand this. There's a word used. That is katagraphen. It's the Greek word, katagraphen. Now, graphen, the base of that word, means to write down. Anybody could write something down on a scroll. You could write something down as graffiti on a wall, whatever. But the word that is used is katagraphen, which means in Greek to write down against someone. So if you look at this, Jesus, knowing everything, Jesus is God in flesh. Here's what happened. Jesus bent down in the dirt and started writing down in the dirt the sins of everyone that was accusing her. Jesus knows everything. He knows their sin. He knows the deepest, darkest secrets about you. And he still loves you. So what does he choose to do? He doesn't choose to have her stoned. He doesn't choose to immediately forgive. He chooses to kneel down and start writing down the sins of everyone surrounding her. Take a look at verse 7. John chapter 8, verse 7. When they kept on questioning him, right? These religious leaders are looking at Jesus. They're saying, dude, what are you doing? Tell us something. When they kept on questioning him, He straightened up, he stood up, and he said to them this. 
Let any one of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. So here they are standing in the temple courts. This woman has been convicted of adultery, which means that multiple witnesses saw her in the act. It's the only way they could convict somebody. They bring her out to the temple courts. They're stones fixing to kill her. They invite Jesus over and say, what do we do? He bends down, starts writing down their sins. They say, dude, what are you doing? He stands up and he says this. Anyone who is without sin, be the first one to throw a stone. Without sin. Without even wanting to do sin. Because not too long before this, Jesus gave this incredible sermon where he says, I don't tell you that if you commit the act of adultery, you're an adulterer. I say if you even think about a woman, you're an adulterer. So he says, without even wanting to do it. Verse 8. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones started to disperse first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up even more, and he asked her this question. Woman, where are they? All these people that were accusing and convicting you of adultery, where did they go? Has no one condemned you? This woman looks at Jesus in the eyes and says, no one, sir. They all left. And this is how he responds. Then neither do I condemn you. This love reveals God's grace. The law reveals our guilt, but Jesus' love reveals God's grace. By God's grace, hear me, people. By God's grace, you are not what you did. One of the most prominent lies of the deceiver, Satan, is that you are nothing more than your worst moment. And by God's grace, you are not what you did. He looks at the other people and said, okay, if you're so perfect, if you've never sinned, throw the stone. What happens? They all leave. (laughs) Revelation chapter 12 calls Satan the accuser. Satan's the one that whispers in your ear and says, You are not good enough. Satan's the one that whispers in your ear and says, no one loves you. Satan's the one that whispers in your ear and says, you are what you've done. Look at what you've done. You've broken the law of God. He doesn't love you. Satan reminds you of your past. Maybe it's time for you to remind him of his future. God has already won. The battle's over. I've read the last book of the Bible. I know the winner. And I know which team I want to be on. Jesus looks at the woman and says, Neither do I condemn you. At this time, Jesus didn't say, You're forgiven. Jesus didn't look at her and say, I understand that that's just the way that you are. (coughs) Jesus didn't look at her and say, I understand that your dad didn't show you the love that you think that you deserved and you're searching for for love from other men. That's not what Jesus says. (coughs) Jesus doesn't look at her and say, I understand that you're always going to struggle with this. And maybe this morning, Jesus is saying to you, I understand that that you lust. I understand that you overeat. I understand that you overspend. I understand that the most prominent sin in the church today that nobody's talking about is gossip. Jesus says, but I don't condemn you. Take a look at verse 11, the second part. Jesus declares... Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. 
And then he follows it up with this statement. Verse 11. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. There's a sense of urgency here. Jesus is looking at us saying, you're trapped in darkness. Can't you see that the light is so much better? You're trapped. Leave your life of sin and follow me. For so many of us, even sitting in this room, for those of us watching online, we're looking at ourselves that we believe only we know about ourselves. We're looking at our behavior saying, man, i got a secret life. I'm this behind closed doors, but I'm this in public. Some of us are caught, caught in adultery. Statistics say that today, men, American men, 70% of American men are addicted to porn. The latest statistic says that 50% of American women are. It's a staggering statistic. Many of us are addicted to materialism, saying, man, i got to get this to keep up with the Joneses. i got to get this so that people believe that I'm better than what I am. Just look at Instagram. Look at Facebook. You don't, you don't post the ugly pictures of yourself. You post the best ones. Some of us are sitting here this morning saying we got so much anger built up in us. We've got so much anger, and we just don't know how to release it. Some of us are sitting here saying, man, I've accepted and I've received Jesus. I recognize the blood that he poured out for me. I recognize the body that was broken for me. But I still, well, for whatever reason, I still feel unforgiven. Some of us sitting in here feel shame. Some of us sitting in here say, I don't like myself. I don't like the life that I'm living. I have doubts. I have guilt. Jesus looks at this woman. And he says, I don't condemn you. Now, go and leave your life of sin. How? How? The law reveals our guilt. Jesus' love reveals our grace. But the light reveals our hope. The light reveals our hope. Jesus says, go now and leave your life of sin. Do you think she was walking away saying, huh, man, I'm just going to go get right back into it. Do you think she's walking away saying, wow, I was almost dead. I was trapped in darkness. I guess I'll just... Go get right back into it. No, she didn't. She walked away full of hope. Take a look at what Jesus says next. Verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, this is what he said. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus reveals our hope. And without hope, we are nothing. He is our hope. You know, when Jesus said, I don't condemn you, he was not just saying, I'm the light of the world. He was saying that he was the light of her world. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, He's the light of your world. You know, there's something really powerful. When we're caught in sin, when we're trapped in darkness, to expose it. In the context of relational community, in the context of people that you trust, there's something powerful about exposing the darkness so that we might be healed. John chapter 12, verse 46, Jesus says this, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. 
Nothing gives hope like light. Think about a movie theater. You walk in, it's dark, your eyes take a minute to adjust, but when the screens come on, you're full of hope, you're full of anticipation. Is the movie going to be good or is it going to be awful? I read a statistic the other day, which was kind of weird. I don't, I don't know if this is true or not, because, I mean, I do know if it's true, because you can trust everything on Google. <laughs> but I read this thing where it says that a rat, rats are nasty, right? We don't like rats. Rats are the ones that live in the darkness. Rats are the ones that sneak out and eat your chips. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Don't leave your chips on the counter, I guess. I don't know. But I read this thing where it says that a rat can only survive 17 hours without seeing light. So here's what you do. Take a rat, and if you find it, catch, well, don't do that. Just Oh, that reminds me a couple weeks ago at the mouse that ran. Okay, sorry. Some of y'all missed that. If you catch a mouse, just, I don't know, if you don't feel like just killing it, trap it in a box, don't let it see light. Okay. Light always defeats darkness. Not even darkness can put out the light of the smallest candle. I'm going to read one more verse, and I'm going to close as Kelvin starts to come up. In Micah, which was one of the prophets of the Old Testament, in Micah chapter 7, Micah says this. He says, do not gloat over me, my enemies. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Some of us today need to put our trust, our hope, our entire lives in the King. The King that is light. In heaven, there will be no sun. In heaven, Jesus is the light. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we we pray that you continue to illuminate darkness. Father, the world that we live in is so full of deceit, of dishonor, of darkness. Father, there's so many things happening around us that we can't even see, but you can. Father, help us turn our lives from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. Jesus, we put our trust in you, the one that gave your life upon the cross, sat in the darkness of the tomb for three days and defeated darkness. You rose from the dead, Lord. You give us our hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help us trust you more intimately. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'll stand up here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, move into offering real quickly. Uh, if some of you don't know how we do offering here, uh, we don't pass any plate or hats or anything like that. Uh, there is a box that's uh, outside the door here that you can put your offering in. There's another box as you go out if you miss this one. You can give online. The address is uh, 
on the screen. And uh, a couple of thoughts uh, that I thought of this morning uh, about offerings is uh, I was reading in Second Corin- uh, Corinthians uh, is about the uh, Macedonian churches, how they had great faith in giving and uh, trusting God. And as Blade said in the sermon this morning about how our faith, if we just have faith in Jesus uh, uh, like we should, we wouldn't really worry about our finances or anything. And uh, one scripture I want to read in Second uh, Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 7, it says, uh, Each of you must make up your own mind about what and how much you give. But don't feel sorry that you must give or don't feel that you are forced to give. But God loves people who love to give. And uh, that's pretty well self-explanatory there. But also in 2 Corinthians in the 8th chapter, the 12th verse, it also says it doesn't matter how much you have. What matters is how much you are willing to give with what you have. So that's what's important with Jesus about tithing, uh, not uh, forcing, but be eager to to give. Let's pray over the offering. Dear God, we just thank you for this time of uh, looking at ourselves and evaluating ourselves about (coughs) realizing how much you have taken care of us, Lord, in many different ways. And as we give our tithe this morning, Lord, that you will guide our hearts and our hands to uh, give uh, back what you have blessed us with. And uh, just uh, pray that as we take this money that we will use it in a mighty way for you and be able to reach others through all this. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. By far, my favorite thing to do as a pastor is what we're fixing to do. Now, don't... Oh, that is hot. Naturally, I guess, huh? You know, I like to preach. I don't think I'm very good at it sometimes, but I like doing it. Um, But my favorite thing as a pastor, as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, is watching people turn their lives over to God. This is why we're here. Outside of this, outside of the mission of God is the simple worship of God. Why does the mission of God exist? To lead people to worship God. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, Peter preaches this incredible message to the people that had just killed Jesus. They had just crucified him. And these these are the people Peter is talking to. And he, he basically looks at them and says, you killed God. But God is powerful and he rose from the dead. And they say, brothers, what do we need to do to be saved? And Peter responds, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So real quickly, what are we fixing to witness? It's really quite simple. Why is water baptism so important? Because the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is what we're celebrating here. The death as though she is fixing to put her life in my hands. And I could take her under and drown her. Her dad's sitting here. It's it's not going to happen, dad. Just saying symbolically, it's possible. As she goes under the water... It's going to be cold and it's going to be dark, just like whenever Jesus gave his life and was put into the tomb. It was cold and it was dark. But on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. So when I pull her up out of that water, what is it symbolic of? The resurrection of Christ. That's why this is so important. This is the death, burial, and resurrection of a believer. 
Michaela, if you want to come on up. I'm going to ask you to get in facing your family here. Is it super cold? It's warm? Oh, hallelujah. Okay, if you want to sit down. Get you ready to step out here. As we talked about <clears throat> this morning, in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus is looking at his disciples, and his disciples are saying, people are saying you're Elijah, people are saying you're just John the Baptist, people are saying you're all kinds of people. And Jesus turns and looks at Peter, and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter responds, well, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's our confession as believers. So, Michaela, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Amen. Well, upon your confession, I'm going to take your hands here. Somehow. There we go. Upon your confession... And for the forgiveness of your sins and the reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Michaela, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, church, let us not forget our part in the discipleship process. To walk alongside Michaela as her parents and family walk alongside her. We as a body of believers need to walk alongside her as well. To teach her the ways of Jesus. To help her understand how to commit her life and her will to the kingship, to the throne of Jesus. Don't forget your part. I'm so glad you guys chose to be with us today. Whoever finds Christ, God bless you.